Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of A Shot of Inspiration. I'm Greg Stevens, your host. I'm excited to be here today with a new friend. I met Lisa Bowman several weeks ago. We just hit it off and had a great time talking, and she told me about a book she'd written, and I got the book. I read it, and Lisa is here just to talk about herself. I found her very inspirational because she's faced some large mountains, I guess you would say in life and had to navigate and do a lot of different things. And she's a marketing person in background, but I'll let her tell you a little about herself. She wrote a book called Harass Hole, and we'll talk a little about that, but this isn't really about the book. It's really about Lisa today. And Lisa, thank you for being on the show today. So glad to have you. Greg, thanks for having me. And I feel the same way. I feel like we had that initial conversation and we're destined to be fast friends here. So the world works in mysterious ways sometimes. It really does. I want to give our viewers and listeners a little background. Lisa was in marketing and she started with some small companies and went to some larger ones and then ran into some barriers in her career and one of her last jobs. So Lisa, why don't you talk us through your life? Tell the people that are listening a kind of view of who you were going up to before you wrote the book. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. I worked for a couple of small companies. One of them was UPS. Spent 15 years there. I worked in a variety of senior level marketing roles and loved what I was doing. I had such amazing opportunities to do cool things like rolling out the UPS store, small little store for a small little company. But I ended up at UPS through a series of really weird twists and turns. I never set out necessarily to be in marketing. Um, growing up, my game plan, because I think when you're young, you have one and it doesn't always work out that way. But the game plan was to get my undergrad in journalism and then go to law school. I actually wanted to be a reporter with a legal background who could report on like big, high profile legal cases. And uh, so that, that was the plan. But ended up getting my undergrad in mass communications and marketing, did not go to law school. And then through a series of, like I said, twists and turns, found my way to UPS. Before that, I had worked in a variety of different industries. My first job out of college was actually a sales job. And I will always tell people I'm not a salesperson. I don't do sales. But I worked for a company that sold printed circuit boards to the automotive industry. And from there, I ended up in the apparel industry, working in a sort of hybrid sales and marketing role. Loved it. I'm a fashionista at heart, so give me anything to do with clothes, I'm happy. From there, went to a technology company that had been doing some of our building. And while I was there, they challenged me to see if I could bring in some business from UPS. And again, I'll repeat it for those people in the back. I'm not a salesperson. But I accidentally sold a million-dollar consulting deal to UPS, and UPS hired me. Uh, that's a backstory on Lisa Bowman. <laughs> that's beautiful. And it's so nice. I also liked when you were talking in your book about the apparel. Was it a family you were working with? That... It was a, a family-owned business, and we, we don't have a lot of those left here these days. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and we, we did all of our manufacturing domestically. We manufactured in North Carolina. But it was a small mom and pop business that sold to the smaller, more expensive retailers, primarily in small towns. Little fun factoid, we also had a private label brand for a larger retailer for Steinmark. And the name of that private label brand was Lisa. So I actually had a clothing line named after me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so nice. And it sounded like you enjoyed those jobs. And then when you got to UPS, it sounded like you just really found your lane and really flourished, like you said, rolling out all the UPS stores. Was it Mailbox, et cetera? That was it was. It? Yeah. And I thought when I was reading the book, it was just like, oh, I remember when that happened. Because <laughs> there, yeah. there wasn't any place you'd really go. I think even back then, Kinko's and who is it? Uh, who's the <laughs> I'm just went blank. Um, so... You, Kinko's, that was before Kinko's was actually purchased by FedEx. Yeah, FedEx. And yeah. at the same time, DHL was looking to get into the domestic market here as well, Yeah, which they did for a minute, and now I think they're gone. But yeah, it was, uh, I was really fortunate. I had the coolest jobs at UPS. 
And I got to do the regular UPS stuff too. There were days where at least once a year, I would be out delivering packages just to remind myself that's where the business was. And those days were challenging in a different way than my office job because they were all physical, yeah. whereas the office job was all mental. But it was really fun for me those couple times a year to put on my brown shorts and get out there with the driver <laughs> and actually work the front line of the business. I loved it. I love that because so many leaders don't get out and get in the front lines and really see what's going on. That is, they're so far removed. The best leaders I've seen in organizations take the time to do that. And not all leaders do, but the ones who do are usually pretty loved by their people and have great relationships with them because they see people as people and not tools and objects. I agree with that. I actually just read where the new incoming CEO of Starbucks spent a month working as a barista to really learn the business. And you have to do that as a leader because to your point, I think that sometimes as you progress in your career, you get so far removed from what the frontline people are doing, that you really lose your perspective. And I would make my team at UPS go out and ride with drivers too, because it was really important to remember that our business wasn't within the four walls of the corporate office. It was on the front line. And it was about how the drivers were interacting with customers, how efficient we were with moving those packages, our safety standards, all of the things that made our business what we were doing environmentally to mitigate carbon, how we were supporting communities. None of that necessarily happens in the corporate office. The ideas come from there, the products come from there, the process comes from there. But if it's not well executed by the people that have to deliver it, no pun intended, it doesn't matter. So for me, it was really important to get out there, touch the work, see the work, feel the work, and understand what was happening there. Yeah. I also love that when you were with UPS, you did something with United Way and you're talking about a person named, was it Dion? I can see you after talking to you, how quickly you probably made friends. I thank you for that. Yeah, there was a scenario and it was actually when I was at United Way. So I, again, just to connect the dots for everybody. The last couple of years that I was at UPS, I had a role in the UPS Foundation. I was asked by our head of HR to take a role in the foundation that was initially a two-pronged role. I went over there to really be the CMO functionally of the foundation to talk about the good work that UPS did in community, which historically we'd been pretty quiet about. And I also was given a social investment portfolio to manage roughly $20 million social investment portfolio with diversity organizations where we would invest into their programming to help lift up communities. Fast forward, I show up for my first day of work at the new job at UPS, and I'm handed a gift with purchase. I was told that I was going to run the company's United Way campaign. Again, I'll say it again. I'm not a salesperson. Like being asked to hit up my fellow employees for a contribution to United Way scared the crap out of me. I was like, nobody is ever going to sit and have coffee with me again because they're afraid that I'm going to be coming with my handout for United Way. But um, that being said, I, you know, I'm a marketer. And so to me, I had to look at United Way as a product and really come up with a value proposition and a future benefit set and package it and market it to our employees to get them to either buy it or buy more of it. And through doing that, I grew the United Way campaign by about 35% over four years, taking it from 48 million to 65 million. Uh, in 2015, I got a phone call from the CEO of United Way, who recruited me to come join them as their global chief marketing officer. And so I made the very tough decision to leave UPS and step fully into using what I do as a marketer to make sure that some person somewhere that I'd probably never meet will have a better tomorrow because of work that I did either today or yesterday. To bring that full circle, when I was at United Way and we were shooting our first set of TV spots for United Way, we were in Miami in January. It was fairly cold outside by Miami standards. 50 degrees in the morning is cold in Miami. And we were in a neighborhood that wasn't so great. As we were getting ready to begin our shoot, there was a homeless man who was laying against a fence and he was covered by a pile of trash to keep warm. He had 
boxes and newspapers and trash bags on top of him. And I initially thought that it was just a pile of trash that was going to be in the way of our shot. And so I went over to look at it and see if we could navigate around it. And as I did so, I saw a hand sticking out from underneath the pile of trash. And unfortunately, my first thought was is that I had just discovered a body. The body belonged to a human who was, in fact, alive. And that was Dion. And Dion was homeless. He had been on the streets in Miami, as he told me, for more than a minute. And I know Dion's backstory as we spoke. He shared it with me. And in that moment, I kind of realized that Dion was the very person that United Way existed to benefit. And so, you know, it was one of those moments where sort of the moon and the stars align. And I thought, this guy is on the street right here in front of me for a reason while we're filming this commercial. So I grabbed our production crew and I said, guys, slight change. I said, we're going to put Dion in the commercial. And I just remember the look of horror on the faces, right? And they said, he, he's not talent. I said, I understand he's not talent. And that's exactly why we're putting him in the spot. He's a real human being faced with the real issues that we address. And he's going in the spot. And so we actually put Dion into the spot. And maybe one of the fun things we do in the show notes is stick a link to the YouTube's video in here if people want to go see Dion. But um, we featured Dion in the spot. And for the rest of my time at United Way, I actually had a framed picture of myself with Dion sitting on my desk because every morning when I'd come into my office, that reminded me of the people that I actually did the work for equivalent to being out on the front lines with the UPS drivers. Yeah. This is who I get up and go to work for every day yeah. to help somebody like Dion have a better life, have a better opportunity. And I love that you saw that and that's what you wanted to portray out there. And I misspoke a minute ago because what made you want to go to the United Way was your engagement with the family in South Texas when you were down there and was it McAllen area what you were saying it was yeah it was McAllen so in 2005 uh when I was at UPS I was one of 40 executives chosen to participate in a program called community internship and essentially what that program did is they split us into four groups and sent us to four different locations across the country you were completely taken out of your work responsibilities for a whole month and sent to a community to engage in that community and do community work. And so I ended up in McAllen for a month and did everything from building houses to doing job training skills for teenagers, which I loved because I love working with younger people and helping prepare them to get into the workforce. And I remember that day as vividly as if it were yesterday. We started in the morning with helping them to fill out job applications. And these were kids, quite frankly, that at that time, the high school graduation rate in McAllen was pretty desperate. It was about 40%. These were kids that in many cases were first gen to maybe go to high school, to graduate high school. Very few of them were headed to college. And so in McAllen at that time, I think the best job that some or best career path some of them could have hoped for was to get a retail job and proceed down a management career track. But they've never had to do things like filling out a job application. And so I remember even basic things like, hey, you know what? Let's not fill that out in pink marker. Let's not put a flower or a heart as the dot over the eye. You know what? You have to write neatly and legibly. Somebody has to be able to read this form. So the morning was all about doing that. In the afternoon, we talked about job interviewing skills, how to do that, how to dress for the interview, how to present yourself for the interview. We conducted mock interviews and I let the rest of the kids make the determination on whether or not they would hire this person. So I played the role of the hiring manager. I interviewed them and then the group got to decide, did they get a job or did they not get a job? That experience for me was life-changing, but there was a family that I met while I was there that was in pretty desperate circumstances, and they were getting help from the local United Way. And so for years after that experience, I contributed to that local United Way 
in an effort to help this family. It was a dad and four girls. The mom had been killed in a car accident and just a really horrific experience. So I think that as a female, and especially as a female leader, where where we can look up for those moments that we have an opportunity to inspire somebody else and to help somebody else, we have to do that. Yeah. And I love that because my wife, she volunteers for a company here called Dress for Success. And she oh, yeah. works with yeah, yeah. She works with women and that helps them with interviews and things like that. I love that you do that kind of work. And I also love the the difference it made for you because it made you want to get out and do something more. And just beyond what you were doing for UPS. And it, it came to where you got the job with United Way. Let's kind of shift gears and talk about that. When you started with not United Way, it seemed to be going pretty well. And then things got really weird almost overnight, it seems. That's a mild way of putting it. Yeah. yeah. So the first, <laughs> yeah, the first two years that I was there, everything was great. And to your point, things got weird about two years after I started in 2017. We made a hire that I was asked to interview for. It was a candidate for a role in the executive team. And the CEO asked me to interview this person. He was coming from a local United Way, coming into a chief transformation officer role to really help us navigate digital transformation. And things got very weird during the interview. Uh, we, like you we said, ended up we, we, real quick, I got to jump in because before everyone hears this, when you told me all these things, I couldn't believe that they actually hired because I work with people all over the world and this was so, so weird. And you made us a mention in there one time about he must have something on someone because I don't know how he would have gotten <laughs> hired. <laughs> That's yeah, the only thing that made sense to me. <laughs> Yeah. And all kidding aside, I joke about the fact that he must have had pictures or documentation or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I really don't know. But I know. Well, I thought it yeah. too. So just to yeah, let you know, all... when I saw that, I went, he's got to have something on someone. <laughs> and trust me, the red flags were waving all over the place. Yeah. We bypassed the yellow caution flag and went straight to the red flag. But yeah, from the minute that um, this person showed up for his interview, I stepped out of my office to greet him. And we've got to lay some context here because we're using a, an audio medium versus a visual medium, but I'm five feet tall on a good day. If I'm standing up really straight and my hair is at maximum capacity and this guy's fairly big, he's six, two or six, three. And he stepped directly into my personal space, looked down at me and told me that I was intimidating. This is a candidate showing up for a job interview. And this is how he's greeting a prospective peer that's interviewing him. And if you've read my book, I have a little bit of a sense of humor here. So while it struck me as weird, I just tried to shake it off and joked about, you know what? Like I'm five feet tall. How intimidating could I possibly be? Why don't you come on into my office? Let's sit down. We'll get to know each other. And during the course of the interview, he made a couple of comments that were really off. I had asked him about how he navigated conflict management. Um, knowing that we were going to need to work closely together. And the reality is people don't always get along in the workplace, right? There's going to be times when we don't agree on an approach or a strategy. And how do you work through that with a partner? And his answer was um, unusual, to say the least. He made a comment about the fact that we'd get behind a closed door and tangle it out, and he thought that would be fun. And again, like warning bells screaming in my head. So I ended up making a comment to my boss, the CEO, as I debriefed him that the candidate was capable and competent to do the job from a technical perspective, but socially awkward and had made a couple of comments that I found unusual. And as I shared with the CEO, the first comment about my being intimidating, the response that I received was, Lisa, you are intimidating. And I never even got to the second comment. And they proceeded to hire him anyway. And from there, madness began. Yeah. Also, someone else had a real odd interview with him too, didn't they? What did he do? He did something. I can't they, remember what it was. 
They did. The CFO interviewed him after I did, and the CFO was male and the candidate was male. And my understanding from the CFO, as he recounted the details of his interview experience, was that the candidate basically sat there doing his emails during the interview the entire time, never made eye contact, had his face in his computer, which, you know, Greg, like you and I are both senior level people. We've interviewed people. We've hired people over our careers. If I had a candidate do that during an interview, I would have terminated the interview right away because that to me is not only disrespectful, but it's a clear indication that this candidate is not interested in engaging in what I'm asking about in the interview process at all. Why would I dare waste my time? I'd actually just say it's an ability issue at that point because he doesn't have the wherewithal all to understand the skills needed to deal with other humans. And when you're at that level, but there's also a myth that the higher you go up, the better communicators a person is at a higher level. And I find that also isn't, that's one of the reasons I have a job (laughs) just (laughs) because I help leaders gain those skills that most of the time that conversations that most people avoid. How can I engage with those where it builds the relationship? But on something like that, I would have probably just, if I, like you said, if I would have been the CFO and just said, you don't have the people skills to manage where we need you to be. Again, you might be technically proficient. You might be the best person out there technically, but when you have to deal with people at this level, you need to be able to deal with people. That's part of the job as well. Yes, that's part of all of our jobs, right? As leaders, you have to be able to deal with people. And so in my mind, there were two very clear indications that he just didn't have the emotional intelligence to be able to manage people or have a role at that level. You can be great technically and know how to do the tactical aspects of your job. But people skills are, they come, they're integrated into everything. You have to be able to do that. Absolutely. But the CEO hired him. And from minute one, there there were issues with this guy where he began what really was a systemic pattern of harassment towards me. Disrespect, harassment, always making comments on my physical appearance. Uh, Every interaction with him became just really nerve-wracking for me because instead of talking about the work He would always have to make some reference to what I was wearing, how my hair looked, my glasses looking great on me. Things that really aren't appropriate in the workplace and have no business relevancy. And so I would have to constantly rebut him with, you know what, we're not here to talk about my outfit. We're here to work through a strategy to address this issue. Or, you know what, the purpose of this meeting is not to discuss my hair. The purpose of this meeting is to put together a plan for us to execute on X. This went on for 15 months and I kept my mouth shut. I thought I was handling it. I think that hindsight's always 2020. And as women, I think we've been trained by society that when this happens, we second guess ourselves, right? And we start to think, did I do something that encouraged him to make this comment? Is he getting some read from me? Did he actually really mean that or am I being too sensitive towards this? And I realize now, looking back, and I would want every female that's listening to this to hear this and internalize it, don't second guess yourself. If it feels wrong, it is wrong. And go with your gut because your gut does not lie. Uh, I spent far too much time, I think, second guessing myself and making excuses for it, but it bothered me. And my gut was telling me the truth. I was questioning myself as to whether or not I was reading too much into it. But like, hindsight forward, no. Like also any good leader does check themselves first. I'll be yeah. honest with you. I think that's the leader's instinct, a real leader, not a title, a real leader's instinct is say, what's my cause of this? Am I doing something? But if you look and you're not, what I want to add on to that, as you stepped out later, you had a conversation with this person several times and consistently his behavior did not change. 
And to me, that's a leader who's not looking at themselves because if someone brings me something and says, this is a problem, I need to look at that. And I didn't see that going on at all from what you were describing in the book. The first thing, get rid of the bad apple, get rid of, because it seemed like for a couple of years, everything was going smooth and it wasn't just you. It ended up being many other people, but that's just it. You let something in like that and you don't address it from a leadership standpoint. You hurt all the other people and people should not have to go to work and feel uncomfortable. They should enjoy 110%. Yeah, they should enjoy their work and they should be be able to depend on their leadership to stand up for them and help them with that. I couldn't agree more. Everybody has got a fundamental right to work in an environment that is safe and respectful, period, period, full stop. They're, that's it. And to your point, as leaders, one of the things I would always tell my folks is if I'm doing something that is offensive to you, that's not resonating with you, come tell me. Because if you don't tell me, I may not know. It may be something that I'm doing unintentionally, and it can be something as simple as a mannerism or whatever. Everybody likes to be managed differently. Yeah. But if you don't tell me, I don't know, and you're not giving me an opportunity to fix it. If you bring it to me and call it to my attention and make me aware, and I don't change that behavior, that's on me and it makes me a poor leader. And so to your point, as a peer, when I continued to tell this person, that's not what we're here to talk about. This is not okay. And there's no response. I, it wasn't resonating. Like right. they, they did not get it right. and clearly yeah. didn't see anything wrong with their behavior. Well, just did not just blind spot. I'll say putting your head in the sand and not looking at what, what a leader needs to be what we really need in our organizations, for sure. Folks, I want you to read the book. I read it and I thought it was just really interesting. So we're going to post where you can get it on our information. But Lisa, what I'd like you to do is share with people some of the barriers you overcame and the lessons you took and learned from that and what you would like to tell other people out there, not just women, but also men, because you underline not all men are like this. This is rare. It's not got in your book, you weren't hammering anyone. This came to you and you had a responsibility to actually speak up because it was brought to you. And so you weren't out on a hunt to do anything. You were out there just doing what you were doing. And you ended up having to be the one that is out front of all this. And that's an awkward position to be in. So what I'd love to hear is walk us through some of the barriers you went through, some of the lessons you learned to inspire people because folks, many times we get things that come our way that we never expected. And sometimes it doesn't turn out the way we want it to. But I also believe there's a reason behind some of this. And I believe you sharing this could be the biggest crown jewel out of some of the problems you've had in your book and being that to help other women and even men as well. Thanks for that. I totally agree. If, um, if you go through a bad experience and you don't do anything with it, it's just an experience, right? If you take that bad experience and use it to make change, then it serves a purpose. And so I, I firmly believe that. And just again, you know, we'll catch everybody up to speed here, but I put up with this for 15 months. I ended up having to go to HR when two women on my team that were younger women of color had issues with him and brought it to me. By policy, I was obligated to go to HR as a human being and a female leader. It was my job to protect my people. I had to go to HR. Shortly after that happened, this was in early 2019, I ended up having to go back to HR because he finally just crossed a line with me. And from the moment that I went back to HR, the CEO who had recruited me began a pattern of retaliation that culminated in 2020 with my losing my job as an act of retaliation for reporting all of this. Yeah. And like Greg said, all of this is in the book. I don't want to suck up all of our time with that, but there were a couple key things that I took away from this experience because, like I said, if you don't do something with it, it's just a bad experience. So number one, it, as a female leader, 
we have to stand up for each other, right? Women already face an incredible amount of crap in the workplace, and that's just the way it is, right? Let's be good to each other and stand up for one another. Second thing is when you see something wrong, um, if we don't stand up, if we don't speak out, that behavior will continue to persist. And it does take a lot of guts to be the one that will call out the wrongdoing. For me, once I lost my job, there was media coverage of my scenario. Given the visibility of United Way, I somehow turned into kind of a face for all of this. Never set out to write a book. What brought me to writing the book was that I wanted to share the learnings that I had with other people because every day in the workplace, there was a woman facing what I did, being harassed. And it doesn't just happen to women. It happens to men too, uh, but women are subjected to it at a far higher percentage rate than men. And there, there were things that I learned on how to navigate those situations. Unfortunately, HR is not your friend. And that was a key learning that I had. I did what I was supposed to do. I went to HR. But HR's role is not to protect the employee. HR is there to protect the company. And so the sad reality is that when you raise an issue, you unfortunately become associated with the problem. And that's really wrong. It shouldn't be that way. In my case, I was raising visibility of the issue to protect the organization. We had an individual there that was creating liability. As chief marketing officer, I had ultimate responsibility for brand and reputation. And those things were being threatened by this individual's behavior. So to Greg's earlier point, when you have a bad apple, the way to fix that is to get rid of the bad apple. In my case, what happened is they allowed that apple to stay and continue to poison the workplace. There were other people that were facing what I was facing, and his behavior was just allowed to continue. So it's really important if you're going through something like that. Number one, don't doubt yourself. Don't second guess. But the minute that something feels off, start documenting and keep a running list of what's happening. What happened? Who might have seen what happened? where it happened, the time, the place. And really important that most people don't understand is this stuff can internalize and manifest itself physically and mentally if it's not addressed. So if you're having some type of reaction to something that's going on, document that too. I know that for me, I would start to have many anxiety attacks towards the end as I was dealing with him and just being within his presence would cause me to have stomach aches. My heartbeat would elevate. So it's really important to keep track of those things too. Yeah. And don't do it on a company computer. <laughs> yeah. right? Use your phone, send yourself an email to your home email address, keep written notes, whatever you need to do, but do not use your work computer to document that. Lisa, thank you. And I also want to piggyback what you said, document those things, but also document exactly what was said, not that they were rude. What did they say specifically? Because that's key. You want to make sure you have exactly what was said. I also want to touch on one thing. You said sometimes you felt like HR is not your friend. When I saw what your HR group did, that's why I was dumbfounded because I've seen really good HR groups and companies. They would have come to your aid right away. It wasn't with your organization. That's what I want to really clarify because I have seen HR groups where they are. I have seen them where they're not. And you had one where there wasn't. Yeah. And I don't want to paint all HR people yeah. with the yeah. same broad brush. That's yeah. not fair. Yeah. But, you know, what is a fact is that HR is there to enable and protect the company, right? And there's two ways that they can do that. Way number one is how it should happen, which is to address the problem and right. protect the company by creating a safe workplace for everybody. The other scenario is the scenario that I encountered where HR completely fell down and succumbed to the wishes of the CEO and didn't address the problem and therefore ended up creating a bigger problem the media coverage, the negative publicity. I read an article in Forbes late last year that 
The United Way had for years been the number one charity out there, but they're paying the price for it because charitable giving was up during the pandemic. United Way's revenue, according to this article, and I may misquote it, but their revenue was down about 28%, $738 million. Uh, these things have a cost to them. They do. They and do. companies need to realize that there is a real tangible cost. There's brand damage, there's reputational damage, and then there's hard dollars. Yeah. And these things cost hard dollars. And unfortunately, people don't see that number until afterwards. That's what, right. And that's the hard part when we talk about how much it costs for every conversation people put off. And it's astronomical. It runs in $20,000 per conversation. When you look at the long-term cost, what happens? But we don't see that up front and we just let things go. And it's interesting. I did a survey on LinkedIn to try to do a white paper on people speaking up. <laughs> and it's so many people say, I don't have problems. I kind of laugh at it. Then you're not out in the real world because everybody has problems. problems. <laughs> you have them with the person you love the most. And then the other people, oh, we just all get along. I said, yeah, there's probably a lot of conversations that you decide not to have. I find people sit and tolerate because even for you, you held on for 15 months. And then finally, there was the straw that breaks the camel's back and you need to go do it. Yeah. And for the people that are saying everything's lovely, there's nothing wrong. I Unfortunately, like I hate to be a pessimist, I'd have to challenge you on that because there's so much going on today and so much stress that we're under as a society and so much division in society that inevitably works its way into the workplace, into our social relationships, into the home. Yeah. So, yeah, I hate to say that nobody has problems. Everybody's got something. Uh, there is somebody out there who truly has nothing and life is perfect. Please tell me what the secret is because yeah. I want in. I'll, I'll sign up for your coaching program, folks. <laughs> yeah, I'm there. <laughs> Until then, I've got a good one to help you speak up. <laughs> and that's what is so funny is I got frustrated on certain things. It's like my whole coaching practice is around helping people say those hard things and do it in different ways. And it was just like, gosh, I wish I could have known you then. I wish I could have helped you then. So that's one of the things I see. It gave me a, a spark about helping women be able to speak their truth. So it doesn't get to that space. So it doesn't maybe go out that long because it just, it hurts. The longer it goes, the, the more it hurts everyone. Agreed. I think it didn't give you a spark though, Greg. I'm a marketer. It gave you a shot of inspiration. Yeah, it? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That's awesome. I do want to share with you, you're starting something new next week. It's called Interview. I would love to have you back on and talk a little more about some of these things. But in the interest of a time for this one, I do want you to talk about your new business that you're just kicking off right now with a couple of other friends and business women that you're actually going out and helping people uh, tell everyone it's about, I think you said, is it called interview? It is called interview. And unfortunately our website is not ready yet, but you can find us on LinkedIn or you can follow me on LinkedIn. And essentially I have curated a collective of CMOs, female CMOs, ironically, that all of us have during the duration of our careers hired thousands of people. And if there's one thing that we know how to do really well, it's find the best talent. And we realized that there was a gap in the market. There are resume writers, there are career coaches, but what we do is a little different. What we do is actually provide a service where we do mock interviews to get you ready for your interview. Uh, so we will role play the hiring manager of the specific job that you're interviewing for. We'll research the company, research the role, and really take you through an in-depth interview that is intended to replicate what you're going to go through in real life and then give you feedback on it. Because again, we're C-level people that have hired. We know how to do this. We know what managers are looking for and think it's a great way to bring our skills to the market to fill a gap in the marketplace, especially with the marketplace being so competitive right now. So for people that are recent graduates looking for their first job, if you're entry-level career, mid-level career, we would love to help you. That's great. 
And so they just find you on Lisa Bowman, B-O-W-M-A-N on LinkedIn, correct? Correct. Or we have a company page for interview that is also on LinkedIn. And we've got a scoop on this because we're not making the official announcement until Wednesday, the 26th. But uh, yeah, super excited about it. You can also email info at interview.co. That's info at I-N hyphen T-E-R-V-I-E-W dot co, C-O, not com. And we're happy to respond and give you some more information. I love that. I love that. Well, before we finish, any inspirational, final inspirational thing you want to say to anyone out there? Because to me, you've inspired me and I love it when people stand up for what they truly believe. But also my hat's off to you for the battles you went through and you had to face that for a lot of people to possibly change what was going on. My hat's off to you for that. But I also want to make sure any final message you would like to give people, our listeners. Yeah, and I'd love to take credit for this being original, but it's not. I met somebody a couple of weeks ago who uses one word, and I'm adopting that from her. So the word that she uses is trust, right? Trust in yourself, trust in the process, trust in life to bring you things when and where they're meant to be for you. And so we all have days that are not great days, but trust the fact that the next day is a new day. And you have an opportunity to shape it the way you want it to be. So just trust that things will get better if you're having a rough time. And if things are good for you, trust that you earned it and you deserve it. Thank you so much, Lisa. Everyone, I want to say thank you so much for listening to another episode of A Shot of Inspiration. If you like and subscribe, it will help us jump up a little and be able to be maybe reach out to more people. With that, I want to say thank you for listening. I wish you the best. See you next time on A Shot of Inspiration. Bye-bye, everyone.